And it's so great to see you today. And thank you for joining us uh, for our visit with Dr. Francisco Galarte. Um, I'm going to start off by posting a link in the chat um, for the captioning for this event, the live captioning for this event. If you are looking for the CART transcript, it will be, uh, we're having some trouble integrating it with Zoom. So you can access it through that link that I just posted in the chat. All right, so I want to start today by acknowledging the land where the University of Washington is located. The Seattle area is the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puleop, Susquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. One way you can go beyond the land acknowledgement is to check out Real Rent Duwamish, and I will drop a link to that in the chat. I also wanna make a few access notes. Um, this event, as we just mentioned, is being captioned in real time. Um, I had a link to how to ac access the captions on Zoom, but in this case, uh, just go back and uh, into the chat and make sure you've got the text open for um, um, captioning. We also have an, an access copy of Dr. Galarte's talk which I will drop into the chat soon. Um, please do not circulate this copy after the talk. And while, uh, while our event is going on today, if you have technical questions or issues, please DM Chingy instead of our speaker so that he can keep going and Chingy can help uh, problem solve uh, whatever your needs are. So without further ado, let me give an introduction to Dr. Francisco Galarte. Uh, we are thrilled to have Dr. Galarte joining us today for our Imagining Trans Futures Cross-Disciplinary Research Group, which is sponsored by the Simpson Center for the Humanities. Francisco J. Galarte is an Assistant Professor of American Studies and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the University of New Mexico where he teaches courses in Chicanx, Latinx, and transgender studies. He was recently appointed director of the Feminist Research Institute at UN UNM as well. He was born and raised in Raleigh, California, located in the Imperial Valley along the US-Mexico border and identifies strongly as transfronterizo, meaning that the borderlands inform his creative and scholarly projects. Dr. Galarte's current work in his forthcoming book, Trown, Brand, blah, <laughs> Brown Transfigurations, Rethinking Race, Gender, and Sexuality in Chicanx and Latinx Studies, asks us to consider how modes such as trans and brownness are always already relational and draws attention to the quote, presence of the bodies, lives, and material circumstances of brown trans subjects, even as they are troped or used as metaphors. His interdisciplinary approaches to trans studies and Chicanx studies help build new ways of thinking about race, gender, and sexuality as intricately imbricated. Dr. Galarte also brings to us knowledge about the foundations of trans studies as a field, as the general editor of Transgender Studies Quarterly, and as a former member of the Transgender Studies Research Cluster at the University of Arizona, which was one of the first programs of its kind in the, U in the United States. I'm so excited to have him join us today, and we're really looking forward to his talk and our Q&A afterwards. So now, Francisco, I will let you take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, first, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, where I am here uh, in Albuquerque, um, by extension, representing the University of New Mexico. I'd like to mention that founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia, the original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. Uh, I'd also very much like to thank professors Ching Yi Cheng and Neil Simpkins for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be part of the series Imagining Trans Futures uh, Research Cluster. And I also really very much um, want to express my gratitude to folks who are here today and made the time uh, 
to listen to this talk uh, from my forthcoming book. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen with you uh, so you can follow along uh, with the visuals. Okay. Um, so my lecture today, as mentioned, is entitled The Wound Makes a Man Transfiguring Chicano Masculinities. So in my book, Brown Transfigurations, Rethinking Race, Gender, Sexuality in Chicanx and Latinx Studies, I examine how Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino trans life, forms of embodiment and desire are erased, constituted as excess, abstracted, or forgotten. The project is, is concerned with how and when trans narratives and figures appear and or disappeared in Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino cultural production, archival record, and politics. I focus on how these trans narratives and figures are constructed discursively and mobilized for cultural and political ends that abstract the <clears throat> me, that abstract the systems of power which discipline, devalue, and dehumanize trans Chicana, Chicano, and Latina Latino populations. I have assembled an eclectic and unruly archive of materials that include literary texts, film, visual art, and court cases, letters, and diaries through which I document and trace what I name Brown Transfiguration, a framework that attends to the intersections of race, class, sexuality, and transsexuality within Chicanx and Latinx studies. The project moves away from the treatment of Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino trans bodies as phenomena or sites of inquiry, and instead fleshes out the affective and corporeal contours of trans, Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino life. So in this text, I argue that the evidence called together in my archive demonstrate that Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino figures, embodiment, desire, one, challenge narratives that render transsexuality inconceivable in Chicanx, Latinx culture, and two, become visible and accrue strategic value, and two, at times, become visible and accrue strategic value to the extent that they can be mobilized to promote neoliberal LGBT politics, and three, represent the excess of racialized gender and sexuality that challenge and, sub and are subject to heteropatriarchal regulation. Today, I will show work from a chapter in my book that has the ambitious aim of excavating and documenting the historical presence of Chicano, Latino, female to male transsexuals or FTMs. To be clear, I do not aim or claim to give an exhaustive history of Chicano, Latino, trans, trans masculine figures, Rather, I've identified a few cultural works and archival traces that allow me to further develop the theorization of brown trans masculinities. For some of us like myself who identify as trans and Chicano, the prospect of excavating the history of Chicano Latino FTMs is exciting. By the same token, embarking on solely an excavation for figures who looked and lived like me could in fact leave me disappointed. This possibility is touched upon by Andrea, Chu, Andrea Long Chu and Drager in their essay, where they note, quote, what do we do with historical figures and, that we don't find live up to our expectations? And quote, more often, we're going to find people that deeply disappoint us. What is our responsibility to them? End quote. While I find the project of documenting and a community over time an important project, the figures I encountered in cultural production, newsletters, and sexological literature forced me to confront the fact that studying transness and racialized transsexuality required me to understand, quote, what it means to be attached to a norm by desire, by habit, by survival. And that's um, uh, Andrea, Long Chu, uh, Andrea Long Chu and uh, Drager again. My lecture today is organized in three parts. First, I'll give a brief background on terminology. Second, I'll, you, I'll discuss Brown Transfiguration, the conceptual frame that animates the book project. And finally, I'll move on to my discussion of Chicano FTM subjectivity. In this analysis of Chicano subjectivity, I examine sexological literature, the documentary film, Mind If I Call You Sir, and various forms of visual culture, such as the Maricons Collective, Digital Mural by artist Manuel Paul, and the photography of Carrie Orvik, to demonstrate how the figure of the Chicano Latino FTM exists as a pathologized and almost entirely impossible figure. Their narratives, their bodies, narratives, and identities are in many cases battlegrounds for shoring up claims to gender categories. 
the end result is a bolstering of gender roles where Chicano femininity and Chicano masculinity are reified as impenetrable boundaries to assure the reproduction of Chicano nationalism. In response to this, I examine a set of texts that grapple with how pathologized Chicano transsexual and or Chicano FTMs transfigure Chicano masculinity. I argue that the expressiveness of brown trans masculinity embodied by the subjects can and should be read against the pathologization of transsexuality and the violence of hegemonic heteropatriarchal Chicano masculinity. More specifically, I read for the loss, lack, and absence that emerges from the position of brownness and transness uh, that leaves room for the production of multiple meanings of masculinity and the attendant desires of racialized masculine subjects. So just briefly on the terminology. I begin with terminology to draw attention to the fact that there will be slippages in relationship to the terms I use today. Trans with an asterisk, transgender, transsexual, Latina, Latino, Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex, and Latinx. My work is situated between, between trans with an asterisk and transsexual, between the X of Chicanex and Latinx, and the A and the O of Chicano and Chicana, and Latina and Latino. Within both trans and Chicana and Chicano and Latina and Latino communities, there is an ongoing discussion on terminology, specifically labeling practices. Throughout the book and in this talk, terminology shifts to attend to the various contexts, debates, time periods, and the extent to which I have knowledge about how individuals identify or, how, or identified themselves. At this moment, among Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino scholars, cultural workers and activists, there has been a sustained effort to replace the gendered A and O for the non-binary, gender neutral, non-conforming and inclusive X. Richard Rodriguez has recently written about the shift to the X and what is, that, what is at stake in labeling, specifically for lives like the ones present in my work, um, who are, quote, incessantly impacted by matters related to gender and sexuality, end quote. One of the takeaway points from his recent essay, X Marks the Spot, that resonates with my work is that the X may, single, may signal an allusion to the significance of gender, even for queer and trans communities. I do not dismiss the X, rather I use it carefully. The X, like the previous articulation of the ampersand within Chicana Chicano studies in the 2000s, represents capacious linguistic play with ethno, ethno nationalist paradigms an expression of gender neutral as opposed to gender inclusive identity category that lines up with the current transgender tipping point. Yet does the X attend to the challenges that trans embodiment and identity presents to ethno-nationalist paradigms? In a recent essay, Nicole Widote Hernandez details how the X has become, quote, particularly potent in trans communities, which explicitly use Latinx to best represent their complicated relationship to gender irrelevant of generation, end quote. She also suggests that the X can carry the affective load of being trans, of being trans and of gender fluidity. This characterization is perhaps how I might depart with those within Latina and Latino studies who cite the X as being fundamentally more inclusive. Alternatively, I would locate the asterisk in trans as capable of attending to the affective load of being trans. I am in agreement with Roy Perez, who notes that, quote, as a supplement and not a substitute, Latinx offers an alternative to the unnecessary imposition of gender, end quote. While I understand that for some Latinx or Chicanx might represent a term that encompasses categories of experience, such as race, sexuality, and gender at once, in my research, it is clear that there is significance in naming oneself as trans, transgender, or transsexual, and in claiming an ethnic category such as Latina, Latino, or Latinx. The act of suturing trans to Latina or Latino or Latinx might be representative of the labor required to be both trans and Latino at once. Perhaps this kind of clunky naming might more fully account for the pleasure and pain experience in doing the signifying work of being trans and Latina and Latino or Chicana and Chicano. In the book and today, I use the terms trans, transgender, and transsexual. My use of transsexual and transsexuality draw primarily from Jay Prosser's work on transsexual narratives. He describes transsexuality as, quote, narrative work, the transformation of the body that requires the remolding of life into a particular narrative shape, end quote. In other words, transsexual narratives are body narratives, texts that engage with the, with the feelings of embodiment. Transsexuality in this context 
is about transition and the transitions of transsexuality are densely layered and unpredictable. Therefore, reading transitions entails reading the anxieties and that transitions bring with them. According to Stryker and Kura, quote, transsexual has been perceived as a, trans, as a restrictive category that required gender changing people to be silent about their personal histories as the price of their access to the medical and legal procedures necessary for their own well being, end quote. Transgender emerged in opposition to transsexual in the US in the 1960s among self organized communities of predominantly white middle class male bodies, male bodied individuals who persistently expressed feminine comportments, uh, identities, and dress. The self, the self descriptor was to quote, resist medical, psychiatric, or sexological labe labeling either as transvestite or transsexual, end quote. From its earliest iterations, transgender has represented a resistance to medicalization, pathologization, the administrative state, and its medical, legal, psychiatric institutions that sought to constrain the socially disruptive potentials of sex, gender, atypicality, and congruence of norm non-normativity. Transgender as a term with political as a term with political heft began to take shape in the 1990s. Transgender as a quote, broadly inclusive rubric for describing the expressions of gender that vary from expected norms and quote, encountered concurrently with the interdisciplinary of, trans of the field of transgender studies. As many of you know, we are living in a transgender tipping point. Trans matters are socially and politically legible and have moved out of diagnosed and pathologized bare life. And I'm quoting Hayward and, Bern Hayward and Weinstein. However, I use transgender as a descriptor to refer to individuals, organizations, or to describe communities. Many of the individuals in my work do not use the word transgender to describe themselves, yet they might locate themselves uh, as being of transgender experience or a part of a broader transgender community. The proximity of transgender to an academic field that is undergoing institutionalization and the circulation of transgender on the cover of Time Magazine is a world apart from the lives, narratives, and desires of the subjects in my book. In fact, many of them are not alive to witness this moment of transgender to social and cultural, uh, the moment, this moment of transgender's rise to social and cultural legibility. Brown transfiguration is a method that I propose for reading brown trans life, forms of embodiment, narrative, and, de and desire to identify how they might be contained, erased, constituted as excess or forgotten. The exercise in defining terminology informs how I came to use the word, use the terms brown and transfiguration. Feeling brown or brownness is a frame developed by Jose Esteban Munoz. He coined and elaborated on the concept of feeling brown and brownness in a handful of essays published post posthumously and just before his death and have recently been published since in, in the monograph. In these essays, Munoz describes the term Latina Latino as at times a problematic term, given that Latinas and Latinos are groups that do not quote, cohere along the lines of race, nation, language, or any conventional demarcation of difference, end quote. Instead, he asks that we move towards modes of belonging and recognition, what he calls, quote, feeling brown, a manera de ser, or a way of being in the world, end quote. A concept that is connected to a, quote, historically specific affective particularity that a subject feels in themselves or recognizes in others. This schema is related to Norma Alarcón's identity and difference, where, ident where difference is a structuring and underlying concept mapping a group's collective identity. Feeling brown is a frame that invokes affective registers that describe a mode of belonging and difference and describes a shared experience of negation that is, quote, enacted by failing to conform to the affective protocols of normative cultural citizenship. For Munoz, ethnicity becomes, quote, a structure of feeling. His theorization of Latinidad through the frame of affect opens up a mode that urges seizing Latino excess. Therefore, I mobilize brownness not a shorthand for Latina, Latino, Chicana, Chicano, or Latinx, Chicanex, but as a capacious affective field of recognition that can account for the appearance of trans embodiment, narratives, and desire when it appears in the archive of cultural texts I have assembled in this book. To be clear, I'm not arguing that there is a universal affective particularity that trans Chicanas and Chicano and Latinas and Latinos share. Rather, I contend that because Munoz's brownness invokes excess, it enables me to read for that excess to see and determine what happens when brownness and trans converge. Most often than not, when brownness and trans converge, it is through the form of figuration, 
a process through which trans bodies, embod trans bodies embodiment desire representations are rendered as figures that can tell us something about a category of experience or simply send in for gender diversity. This kind of figuration does not produce and imbue critical subjectivity, consciousness, or humanity. Rather, it extract, abstracts the labor of trans in relationship to brownness. So then brown transfiguration is reading for the relationality of trans and brownness. It identifies the vitality, excess, and process of mattering, the quote through, of, in, and across, and quote, of trans meets the unboundedness of brown. Brown transfiguration exposes what makes trans life livable or unlivable and accounts for systems of valuation that might position brownness in opposition to or incompatible with trans. Finally, Brown Transfiguration asks us to foreground specificity while emphasizing the sensuous pleasures and pains in seizing and embodying excess. To best eliminate the claim that trans masculinity is invisible, I find it best to begin with one of the two significant moments of trans, Latina, Latino, Latinx, and Chigana, Ch Chigano, Chiganex representation that framed the book. On June 13th of 2015, in the heart of the Mission District, Galeria de la Raza invaded a digital mural on the gallery's exterior wall on Bryant Avenue entitled Por Vida by visual artist Manuel Paul, member of Los Angeles of the Los Angeles-based collective Maricon Collective. The Maricon Collective, a group of queer Chicano Latino DJs and artists, were invited by Galeria de la Raza due to their social and cultural work around pres preserving queer and Chicano and Chicana and Latina and Latino East Los Angeles to bring the spirit of their work to the Mission District during LGBTQ Pride Month. Paul, an artist, an artist part of the now defunct Maricon Collective, describes the group's work as creating, quote, brown space for people who don't really have it, end quote. Paul is referencing the fact that gay spaces are typically white and notes that there are spaces in the gay community where, quote, some gay Latinos aren't accepted, end quote. He also notes that within Chicano Latino spaces, there is a refusal to acknowledge the existence of gay and lesbian identities. Therefore, the mural was conceived as an assertion that, quote, we gay Latinos exist from the little boy in the neighborhood to that old veterana, end quote. According to Gilda Posada, Paul also noted that the mural was created to celebrate transgender life, especially in the Latino community. The title of the mural, Por Vida, or For Life, announces existence, but also the permanence of gay, lesbian, and transgender Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex communities and Latina, Latino, Latinx communities. A queer brown style is enacted in the visually in the mural through the use of artistic motifs and imagery associated with lowrider, pinto, and paño art. The mural featured a, tri a triptych of scenes framed by chains and adorned by flowers. At the center, there is a solitary figure, a cholo bare-chested with tattoo-like thorns adorning his chest, a tattooed teardrop on his face, his glance looking off into the distance, and a scroll with the phrase, por vida, or for life. It's positioned just below his torso. The central figure also features lines that radiate outward, uh, taking visual cues from traditional images of La Virgen and Guadalupe. The solitary figure is flanked by two couples, two mustached cholos, eyes closed with their heads tilted downward, one embracing the other from behind, and two cholas gazing into each other's eyes, one holding the other's face, foreshadowing a kiss. The figures are stylized within queer homeboy, homegirl aesthetics, a style that circulates within quote, and this is Richard T. Rodriguez, Gay Chicano, gay Chicano, Chicano, I'm sorry, Chicano Latino gay male spaces that emanate from the interplay of materiality and fantasy. The mural stages public fantasy, which according to Teresa de Loretis rec recasts, quote, existing cultural narratives, refuse, reusing their structures and thematic concerns, but bringing in new material, new contents, new characters or cultural agents, new issues and themes drawn around contem the contemporary world and its social arrangements, end quote. The representation of queer homeboy, homegirl aesthetics on a mural located on the corner of 24th Street and Bryant Street in San Francisco, therefore makes this SF Mission District Street corner a site of fantasy where queer homeboys and homegirls can and will congregate for episodic fulfillment. Almost immediately following the dedication of the mural on June 13th, it became the focus of threats on social media. By June 16th, the mural was defaced. The frames depicted, depicting the two same-sex couples in the text Por Vida were scribbled out with red and blue spray paint. 
Galeria de la Raza immediately launched a social media campaign and received, report to re received support to replace the mural. With more media attention, artist Manuel Paul and others elaborated on the imagery and message of the mural. In the first instance of in the first instance of vandalism, the solitary figure in the center was left unmarked by the vandals, signaling a sense of connection with that image. As media coverage began to circulate, it was disclosed that the man in the center of the mural was a trans man. The thorns that adorn the man's bare chest symbolize the scars associated are meant to symbolize the scars associated with top surgery. The mural was replaced two additional times, and the center figure was also crossed out in each of the subsequent. Uh, acts of vandalism, which ultimately included arson. The markers of transness in the mural were initially visibly imperceptible to the vandals, which suggests that Paul's depiction of trans masculinity falls in line with the norms of Chicano masculinity. The markers of trans in the mural index trans surgery, but also very, very clearly overlap with forms of body modification, such as tattoos, specifically pinto tattoos that for some would suggest a non-trans brown masculinity that is apart from the queer homeboy aesthetics depicted in the romantic scenes between the gay and lesbian chola and cholo couples. From the perspective of the vandals, the scars may simply look like thorns tattooed across the homeboy's chest. To a trans Chicano, the placement of the thorns just under the pecs resemble the scars on their own chest. Thorns and chains are common motifs in pinto tattoos and paño arte that symbolize pain and imprisonment. Therefore, in the mural, the use of these two symbols align pain and imprisonment with being trans. Given that the representation of trans masculinity was initially imperceptible to the vandals, this provokes us to consider that in the barrio, trans masculinity is, quote, beneath notice, but still like everybody else. And this is something that, this is something other than being in the closet or passing. This disrupts the te teleology of coming out and transition that Manuel Paul and others imagined in the project. The trans cholo disrupts the mural's queer brown space. Unlike the two couples, he gazes outward into the distance and towards the horizon, which is interesting aligns with Richard T. Rodriguez's anal analysis of Chicano movement era visual culture that featured the Chicano family with the Chicano patriarch at the center as the only figure allowed a future-oriented gaze. Although the figure is featured prominently in the center, he is alone. The couples are oriented away from him and he bears the markers of pain inscribed upon his body, the scars on the chest and, and the tattooed teardrop on his face. In contrast to the queer homeboy homegirls whose representations create possibis, possibilities for pleasure, fantasy, and collectivity, the solitary trans cholo is contained by the chains that frame him and is legible as trans only in relationship to the scars that make evident the constructedness of transsexuality. This provokes me to ask, what kind of future are brown trans folks imagine looking towards? And it appears to be a future characterized by solitude and pain. Here, the visual overlap of tatuaje and scars on the body, on the brown body, resonate with a material force not readily apparent in Chicana Chicano transgender narratives. More specifically, the cloth surface uh, on which the digital mural is printed can be likened to human skin, a collective garment inscribed with brown trans social discourse. Following Ben Olin's description of placas as, quote, floating signifiers that remain grounded on the material and subjective conditions of their production and consumption, end quote, I suggest that the mural, I suggest that in the mural, the scars might function as a placa. The placa is a badge, is a badge or epistemy, uh, epistem, sorry, uh, the placa, according to Olin, is a, quote, Chicana Chicano lump and proletariat practice of ritually marking space for the purpose of laying symbolic, even material claim, end quote. In contrast to the two couples who invoked fantasy, the single trans cholo's brown marked body scripts the entrance of a brown trans narrative. This narrative is one of a brown trans subject that falls outside the confines of gender and sexuality prescribed by both Chicana Chicano culture, the state, the law, and other normative grids. Here, the brown trans cicatrix marked body can be read as claiming a narrative as one's own. Despite the fact that the, mural, that the mural was envisioned by artist Manuel Paul to claim an existence of gay, lesbian, and trans identities with Chicana Chicano and Latino Latino culture, the trans cholo disrupts claims to visibility politics. Unlike the queer homeboys, homegirls, 
The trans homeboy does not at first glance disrupt the brown space. The placas of transness are imperceptible to those outside the LGBT community until the figure is announced as trans. In the example of the Maricon Collective's digital mural Por Vida, it is the markers of transness that are imperceptible in relationship to brownness. In Manuel Paul's Trans Cholo, we encounter a register of brown transness that disrupts brown style and is formed through the cut, the mark on the mural that transfigures embodiment. As noted by Ava Hayward, the cut is possibility. And thus the figuration the, of the, mar the scars as markers of transness disrupt, affirm, and rescript brownness. The scars of top surgery are not the only signs that marks brown transmasculinity in this example. Trans also cuts brownness. The trans cut enacts regeneration and produces a new figuration of Chicano masculinity, one that is unbounded and marked by trans by brown and trans affective excess. The material discursive cut reimagines re the bodily bound boundaries between brownness and transness, where the tatuajes, tattoos, scars can index a quote, body created out of ingenuity, necessity, ingenuity, and survival, end quote. For those in the know, the scars as they are represented as thorns in this image make evident both the constructiveness of transsexuality but also proclaim a racialized barrio identity and the pleasures and dolores or pain of both. The tatuajes, scars as placas write trans embodiment into the barrio. The placas that mark the body as trans also mark the body as a cholo, as a chicano. The trans cholo and his tattoo marked brown body initially unscathed by the violent vandalism of the, of the queer, of the queer figures in the mural highlight how transsexuality can be imperceptible yet at the same time present in the barrio. So now I'll move on to the next part of the talk um, in which I engage a little bit of Antonio Viego's work, uh, who is in the talk is inspired by a quote from his book, Dead Subjects. So now I ask for a minute, we move backwards from the Cholo to the Pachuco. The title of this letter, of this lecture, is inspired by Antonio Viego's discussion of the figure of the Zoot Suter and, Pach and Pachuco. In his book, Dead Subjects, Antonio Viego insists that Latina Latino studies consider a politics of loss and its theorization of Latina Latino politics and subjectivity. In his discussion of Pachuco's Viego posits that, quote, the wound makes a man, quote, a shorthand to say that the constitutive loss, the primordial wound suffered by the human speaking organism creates the generative conditions for subjectivity and desire, end quote. Viego's discussion of the figure of the zoot suitor and Pachuca and Pachuco focuses on their ability to trouble identity categories, specifically within social science literature, both pathologizing and sympathetic. For Viego, the Pachuco and Pachuca and zoot suitor and zoot suit culture introduced a kind of anti-identity politics that despite being clearly linked to Mexican American culture also runs beyond identity and culture as defined according to categories of race and ethnicity. I see this in conversation with Jose Esteban Munoz's notion of brownness, which can describe how various, quote, historically coherent groups feel differently and navigate the world on a different emotional register, end quote. Viego compellingly discusses how pachucas and pachucos are able to extract pleasure from goods, an example being fashion and care for the self. There is a, quote, politics of resistance embedded in these self-regarding practices of pleasure revealed when one deigns to care for one's own disprized body, end quote. The figure of the zoot suitor and Pachuca and Pachuco becomes relevant to the study as figures that both Chicanas, Chicanos, and Anglos have attempted to wrestle down into recognizable, manageable identities, enigmatic sy symptoms of a racist culture. Viego notes that the zoot suitor and Pachuca, Pachuco could only register as pathological within Mexican and Mexican-American psychology given that its central tenets and theories are informed by ego psychology. Viego characterizes ego, psycho ego psychology's quote, understanding of the human psyche and the related issues of how to theorize trauma loss, adaptation and assimilation, end quote, as informed by problematic and reductive assumptions attributed to a certain North American distortion of Freudian theory. Viego notes that as Lacan would have it, quote, the conception of psychoanalysis in the United States has been inflected towards the adaptation of the individual to the social environment. The search for behavior patterns and the objectifications implied the notion of, quote, human relations, end quote, and that was Lacan. Um, 
Vigo's research reveals that, quote, the history of psychology and psychoanalysis in the United States has always included as a crucial part of its history a witting and unwitting reflection on the meaning of ethnic racialized difference in US culture, end quote. More broadly, Vigo's project demonstrates how ego and social psychology enacts a, quote, kind of exacting trouble for ethnic racialized subjects in clinical, extra legal, and legal contexts in the United States beginning in the mid 20th century. Vigo locates this moment in the mid 20th century as a moment by which experts in the fields of psychology have insinuated itself within the legal apparatus in the process of crafting and coding psych psychologistic and reductive legal and extra legal understandings of ethnic racialized subjectivity, trauma and loss that continue to endure today. Similarly, in the mid 20th century, the, the mid 20th century marked a significant moment through which the treatment of transsexuals and their access to medical care was being debated, am debated among psychologists, psychoanalysts, and sexologists. The outcome of these debates continue to have significant impact on how trans people access care today. In relationship to transsexuality, psychoanalysts largely relied on clinical observations and interpretations of Freud to speculate on childhood causes of a quote, transsexual wish. Through the 1960s, psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts who proclaimed transsexuals as mentally ill wielded more influence and power within medical practice, most of whom advocated for psychotherapeutic treatment as opposed to transsexual surgery as treatment. By the late 1960s, various gender clinics had devised criteria for selecting candidates for sexual reassignment surgery. The criteria required psychological evaluation to ascertain that patients had a history of cross-gender identification and no severe mental illness. Many clinics set up gatekeeping systems to which they could control access to treatment. And in the case of the Stanford Gender Clinic, tailored standards to be able to reject patients who did not exemplify success and did not, did not fit neatly into categories they had devised. Ideal candidates were expected to live as heterosexuals and to marry after surgery. In other words, good surgical candidates would assimilate to dominant conventions of gender and sexuality. By this time, transsexuals began to warn each other from mentioning certain details about their sex life. Like for example, if they derived sexual pleasure from their genitals or had the intention of living as homosexuals after surgery. Many felt it necessary to narrate a certain standard story to the psychiatrists that were evaluating them. We can see how like in the context of ethnic and racial minorities, psychoanalysis has quote, been inflected toward the adaptation of the individual into, into the social environment, end quote. Furthermore, psychology and psychoanalysis in the United States has included as part of its history, reflection on the meaning of sexual difference in US culture, just as Vigo similarly points out for ethnic racialized difference. Early to mid 20th century popular culture and social scientific research conceptualized the Chicano subject as inherently criminal. Researchers labored to clinically prove that a propensity for criminal behavior emerged from feeble-mindedness. By the same token, Dr. Robert Stoller was interested in the psychological forces that resulted in transsexualism and regarded transsexualism as a petri dish for human sexuality. The study of transsexualism does has its roots in the eugenics movements as it interacted and was influenced by sexology. According to Lair, quote, Eugenicists and sexologists alike relied heavily on degeneracy as an explanation for a number of sexual and gender perversions and aligned perversions with criminality and psychiatric disability, end quote. Furthermore, after World War II, when eugenic discourse had fallen out of public discourse, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts linked transvestism and transsexualism with criminality and degeneracy. They heavily attributed this to her hereditary factors, which closely mirrors eugenic and psychiatric discourse about Mexican American criminality. Chicana, Chicano, and Latino Latino studies scholars have comprehensively documented the intersection of eugenicist, scientific, and psychiatric discourses and sh that shape the meaning of race, specifically the racialization of Mexican Americans. Let's see. So a narrative I found that I encountered in my research is an example of the intersection of pathologizing of Mexican Americans and transsexuals. I found this narrative, I found this narrative um, in, a, in a sexological study entitled uh, Adult Manifestations of Female Transsexualism by psychiatrist Ira B. Pauli, published in 1969. In this study, Pauli presents four case reports of quote, female transsexualism. One of the four case studies is, is an individual named CK, who was the third of eight children born to a Mexican-American family in a big Western city. 
In Polly's discussion of CK, we learned that he was referred to Polly by a local court psychiatrist. The study reveals that CK's contact with sexual reassignment, psychological and medical professionals occurs through criminality. In the summer of 1966, CK had a violent argument with his wife and in a confrontation with her, slapped her. She pressed charges and had CK incarcerated for assault and battery. During booking, a shower was required and it was revealed that CK was, quote, female. He was found to have, have a penis in his pants fashioned out of a sock stuffed with paper. He was referred to a local court psychiatrist who then referred CK to the medical school of the University of Oregon for, quote, psychiatric and chromosomal evaluations, unquote. There, he was subject to psychiatric evaluations that included the collection of family history, his life history, sexual history, and an IQ, and an IQ test. And he also endured psych physical examinations that included measuring the clitoris and sex chromatin exams. After being held for 28 days, it was recommended that CK receive testosterone therapy and a bilateral mastectomy. CK was release, released from the psychiatric ward to begin testosterone therapy and was readmitted to the hospital two months after his bi was readmitted re was readmitted to the hospital two months later for his bilateral mastectomy or top surgery. At this time, the hospital administration denied permission for CK's operation, overriding the recommendations of the psychiatry department. He was denied on the following grounds, and this is from the study. Uh, if the patient one day should decide that he wanted to become female again, the hospital might be held responsible with the possibility of legal complications. And secondly, if the operation were to be publicized, the hospital might become a drawing point for others wanting this type of, this type of operation, end quote. Polly notes that CK was deeply disappointed by this, but we do not learn any further information about his fate. And we were far Sorry, not ready for that. Um, in the study, CK is described by Polly as quiet and shy, but friendly and cooperative. He is described as having a Spanish accent with his English being fairly good for simple words. And that's directly from uh, the study. Uh, but CK, who, quote, readily admitted that he could not understand anything but most simple sentences, end quote. And this is, I kind of jumbled that up, but that's Polly describing how, you know, how good he could speak English despite the Spanish accent. Um, according to Polly, CK's IQ score is described as quite low and within the upper, quote, mental defective range. Polly does concede that language accounts for the low IQ scores, but does not note that language and culture perhaps mediated CK's response to questions about his sexual history. CK is described by Dr. Polly as being most naive in the areas of, quote, general sexuality, intercourse, pregnancy, and what is possible for him medically or surgically in the direction of sex assignment, end quote. CK's narrative and background appear in stark contrast to the other case studies presented in Polly's article. For example, ER, who was Caucasian, wrote a letter to the medical school requesting help and was college educated. DL, who was also Caucasian, self-admitted himself to the hospital to undergo an exploratory laparotomy to determine the presence of testes as this person perceives himself to be male on the inside. The final case study is TS, who is Caucasian, described by Polly as, quote, sophisticated in her speech and a sensitive, aware, and bright young person, end quote. Of significance here is how Polly describes CK as ignorant about sexuality, but is rather surprised about CK's ability to pass as a male. This passing is, lo is located specifically in CK's ability to obtain and, ma and maintain employment in sectors overrepresented by immigrant and working class Mexican men, such as, quote, make carrying bricks, working the harvest, or washing dishes, end quote. Psychologically, the loss of the penis CK had fashioned for himself created a depression because, of, because as according to Polly, it had become part of CK. Though, while the penis of CK's making was real to him, when it was taken away by the police at booking and he is referred and he is referred to psychiatric professionals, CK is castrated. He incurs a wound, an ineffable, unspeakable loss. CK's fashioning of transsexuality is unreadable and irreconcilable within the limits of psychiatric and medicalized discourses that Polly and others attempt to impose on him. CK's, quote, limited English and, quote, mental defectiveness and his own culturally specific understanding of gender and sexual roles are threatening to the extent that sexual assignment might result and the opportunity for CK to continue to build a life as a Mexican man.
CK is not the assimilable subject, assimilable subject that gender clinics privilege in their early gatekeeping practices. To, and I want to be mindful of time, so we have Q&A. So I'm going to skip a, a section here. Um, and it, this is in the book. So I guess this can be a plug to encourage you all to, 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 buy, the, to buy the book if you, if you are interested. Um, but I wanted to conclude um, with this figure from Mind If I Call You Sir, um, uh, which was a film that was done in the um, 90s. So I need to go to Prado here. Just give me one second. I have two brothers. Okay. So the, in the film, Mind If I Call You Sir, which was, um, let me make sure I get the director's name for us here to honor the film. So Carla Rosales directed Mind If I Call You Sir, and um, this was this film uh, first came out in 2004. And the film itself directly addresses differences and similarities between Chicano Latino FTMs and Chicano Latina butches. And so the film itself is characterized by um, the director and um, the producer as an oral history video, a project that documents queer and trans Latina history through testimonies of Chicana and Latina butch lesbians and Chicano Latino and Afro Latino transgender men. Um, and in this film, the directors kind of put the kind of butch FTM borderlands at play within a specifically Chicanx, Chicano, Latinx, Latino context, uh, which is to really kind of change what's kind of ongoing between, I think, lesbian feminism, post-sex wars in San Francisco, more specifically between the um, white FTM community, I would say. Um, and so in this work, we kind of get a, a more nuanced understanding of what that borderlands or what those border wars might mean in a racialized context. And because I'm talking about masculinity, trans masculinities, I'm going to go to the narrative of Prado, which is a transsexual um, uh, man. He identifies as a transsexual Chicano. Um, and so I'll share with you a little bit about Prado. Okay. So in his narrative, as Gomez is kind of talking about his life, um, he does not refer specifically to his Czech Chicano identity or culture at all. Um, he doesn't romanticize Chicano masculinity and he very clearly underscores that becoming a man is a process for him that's rooted in encountering the unknown and the unexpected. Um, and so in, in the video, he says this about transitioning. He says, it's more complicated than that. And, and when he says in that, it's the discussion itself is about access to power and privilege when one transitions from female to male. Um, he says it's more complicated than that. Those things are some of the things that people kind of see on the surface and they really romanticize those aspects of like maleness. He's like, you know what? You learn real quick that it's not only, only about that there's so much more to it and that you get more than you more than you didn't expect that you didn't ask for that that comes with the package you can't pick or choose what you get what happens when you have surgery and get on hormones it's like whatever is going to happen is going to happen it's out of your control really uh, and here he's also directly addressing kind of comments about wanting to you know take testosterone for a beard or to not or how might one might want to modify certain parts of their body um, in relationship to passing as opposed to kind of a uh, understanding of embodiedness of masculinity and kind of the changes that transitioning, especially on testosterone, might change within the body. And so what Gomez is describing here is a limitation within the critique that transitioning from female to male results in ready access to male authority and privilege. Rather, he suggests that Chicano trans masculinity is produced as a result of satisfying the need to become a man, quickly learning how to grapple with the expectations attached to what it means to be a Mexican-American man and accepting that there may be failure. Uh, 
the need to be a man then is not always rooted in upholding cultural nationalist and heterosexist institutions like La Familia. In Richard T. Rodriguez's discussion of Chicanos and the negative effects of patriarchy embedded in Chicano culture, he notes that the impact of the need to be a man codifies La Familia or the family as a quote, sacred institution where gender roles are fixed in the name of tradition, end quote. Gomez's comments about the unexpected outcome of his transition reveals how he is able to identify the failures he inevitably encountered as he transitioned. When Gomez notes, you can't pick and choose what you get and what happens when you have surgery and get on hormones. It's like, whatever is going to happen is gonna happen. It's out of your control, really. We see him come to terms with lack or loss. We can see Gomez's process becoming marked by uncertainty, the loss of the certainties about being a man that Gomez might have expected and ultimately encounter a narration, a narration in which we find him in the process of endlessly creating himself. Like the Pachuco and Pachuca and the Zoot Suitor, Gomez's Chicano transsexual narrative reveals that he does not craft his racialized transsexuality, quote, entirely free of social and cultural contingencies, end quote, but does so in a way that the reason for his being, quote, uh, reason for his being can't comfortably rest on an explication that simply interprets him as an X-ray of the power relations of a particular social order. We cannot equate Gomez's understanding of what it means to be a man as simply springing, springing in opposition to the rigid, rigidity of Chicano no, cultural nationalism. Rather, we are able to see that his bodily archive is mediated by the instability of the forms of Chicano masculinities that he has encountered. And another example, we might gain further insight into how Gomez's transsexual narrative transfigures masculinity. In the film, he begins his story by discussing his relationship with his brother and how that has shaped how he understands transitioning. And I'll play Prado so we can see him talk about this. I have two brothers, one older and one younger. Um, so I'm the middle child and was born the only girl, which is a pretty important and significant thing. It's a trip because my brother, my little brother and I are really, he's 23. And I started transitioning when he was, physically transitioning when he was about 19. And so in some sense, we're both kind of coming into like adult manhood at the same time, which is really interesting. And I think for him, you know, kind of becoming more mature and being a man and really trying to figure out what kind of man he is and wants to be in the world, part of that is also that, and we talked about that recently, part of that is him figuring out how he expresses his love and his affection and his feelings. And, and so being able to explore that together as men, you know, makes a difference. So here we see Gomez's transsexual narrative deviate from standard formulas. He's not narrating his transition as a solitary journey, rather he locates his brother who assists as part of this experience. His brother uh, is not positioned as an authority on masculinity, rather he positions the two of them learning to be men relationally. The decisions about how to do that are not derived from a preset manual. On the contrary, the two are fashioning a Chicano masculinity that is relational and not rooted within biologic, biological determinist notions of what constitutes a man. The Chicano masculinity Gomez describes as constituted between him and his brother is not one that is born out of a nature, much less a Chicano nature. The carnalismo or brotherhood we see here is one born out of blood relations in the sense that the two are related, but this, rela but this relation is, this is a relation that is privileged as all, and they also, but they also refute biological determin deterministic prescriptions of brotherhood and manhood. For both, there is seemingly not nothing natural about being a man. So I'm gonna skip here. I was gonna share some photos with you, but again, I wanna be mindful of time. Um, and so, If we go back to thinking about the cut and the bare-chested cholo that I talked about at the beginning of the talk, right, and we think about how the scars uh, of the thorns are precisely situated to frame the pectoral muscle, so to give the illusion of its absence, the scar is a carving made by the self, the creation of the body that is made to suit 
a fantasy in order to make space for desire. If we put this portrayal in conversation with Gomez's transsexual narrative in Mind If I Call You Sir, the two elements, image and narration, function as, quote, one entity without collapsing into the other, end quote. Rather, we see how the body and narrative are continuously recreated and continue to be recreated. The cut is possibility and the wound makes a man. Thus, the scar appears as the markers of transness that disrupt, affirm, and rescript brownness. The trans cut enacts regeneration and produces a new figuration of Chicano masculinity, one that is unbounded and marked by brown and trans affective excess. In this photograph, it is the desire for community, for carnalismo. In, in the photo, body boundaries of brownness are reimagined and the scars index of body created out of necessity, ingenuity, and survival. The body, the barely discernible scars in the image uh, make evidence of the both constructedness of transsexuality, but also rescript Chicano masculinity through losses, pleasures, and pains. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Francisco. That was so illuminating and I'm really excited for us to have a conversation about it. Um, so here is the procedure for what we're going to do for Q&A. Uh, since we're all in Zoom land to keep stack, um, what I would like you to do is if you have a question that you would like to ask Dr. Galarte, could you please um, DM Chingy? Uh, Chingy's first name is spelled C H I N G dash I N. Chingy is going to compile questions and kind of put them together so we can also ask different kinds of questions in the space we have left. And I will uh, read aloud the questions um, as they come in. So we'll just take a sec, uh, you know, get your thoughts together if you want to write a question and uh, DM it to Chingy. I can. I also want to ask a question while we're waiting for all of them to come in. So what, why don't I get the ball rolling with that? So um, Francisco, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about the methods that you use to do your work. I have been particularly interested in, you know, your background and education and how that has like moved forward with within trans studies. Um, yeah. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, I had, um, I, I didn't intend to finish the PhD in education. I had actually gotten into the Chicano Studies program at Santa Barbara in the second cohorts. And it became very evident to me that my understanding of masculinities and femininities specifically in thinking of queer turn at that point, and then what was already kind of a nascent trans understanding of racialized masculinities and femininities wasn't really compatible, I think, in terms of um, what Chicano studies could do for me in terms of where I wanted to go. And so I went back, you know, to my mentor in, in education because I had wanted to go into education because pedagogy is, is so kind of integral to the work that I do. And so in terms of the methods, I mean, I went back to PhD program. And so that's why I have the PhD in education because I had a advisor who just was really um, supportive and let me kind of seek out the people at University of Illinois who could really kind of help me think this, think through this project. Um, but the beginning stages of the project begin there where I'm really kind of voraciously wanting to encounter all these different um, texts that have any kind of presence or trace of racialized, specifically Chicano, Latino, uh, masculinity, femininity, those types of narratives. And so I had initially wanted to write some kind of comprehensive history, and it became very clear that the that that it's, it, it felt an impossible feat. I'm sure that it could be done in some way, but I just didn't have the capacity to 
imagine it that way. And so um, the book is a result of me putting together all of the objects or cultural objects that I could put together around a like theme or a debate, right? Whether that debate is in trans studies or where it's in Chicano feminism. Um, and so the methods come from wanting to situate these narratives about individuals um, that really, really moved me and that also kind of aligned with these very interesting moments uh, within Chicano feminism, especially Chicano lesbian feminist history, um, but then also how in trans studies as, as a field, right? Um, and so that was kind of the method is to kind of look at all of these objects that I've collected um, and, and these stories and, and you know pieces and, and remnants and, and kind of make sense of how I might locate them together to say something about, in this case, talking today about, you know, Chicano masculinity broadly, but specifically trans uh, Chicano, Chicanx masculinity. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so I will start with our next next first question, which is a, is, which is a fun one. Um, this is from Tori Neal. Uh, what was the most surprising thing you found in your research? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the most surprising thing um, is, or at least the 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 piece of the text that I found that uh, unfortunately ultimately didn't make it into the book, but one that um, I'll talk about later today when I, I meet with the writing group at the University of Washington is this obituary that I found um, at in within the FPM newsletter, which was a newsletter that was founded by Lou Sullivan. And Lou Sullivan is, you know, self-proclaimed self a cultural historian of trans history based out of San Francisco, identified as a trans um, uh, homosexual, I would say. He's a trans gay man. Um, and he, he really wanted to document his identity as a trans gay man because he went to Stanford and Stanford, the, the gender clinic denied him care. They were like, with this idea of a trans man wanting to transition to be with men, it makes no sense to them for them. And so his life's mission from what I understand it from reading his diaries was to very, was to historicize his identity. And so, you know, one of the things that I found in his papers and reading his diaries um, the most, I mean, that in itself is an incredible archive. So if you have the opportunity to, to visit it, I encourage you to do so. But I, I did find in, in one of the later issues after he, long after he had passed away, um, well, not so long, I guess it's like from the 90s as well. Um, I found this obituary in the FTM newsletter that documented the death of a trans um, Latino Latinx person who, um, passed away from HIV, from, from AIDS-related illness, right? And so this really kind of hit me in a place where this person's narrative in their life is documented in an obituary in the same form and fashion um, in which, you know, other gay Latinos were being documented in obituaries in the Bay Area Reporter. Horacio Roque Ramirez has this brilliant essay in which he's wanting to really excavate the narratives of you know, gay Latinos who were also passing away in great numbers from the epidemic, but you know, how to document them, how to know about them in their lives in San Francisco. And so he does this practice where he goes through, you know, obituaries to find, to excavate their histories and know more about them in their lives. And then I found this particular obituary, um, which is about, you know, this, this, this man who passed away and he left behind a trans man, he left behind a daughter and a partner. And so we get just these small little traces about what he suffered in his life. And for me, it resonates very closely because, you know, he was born um, in the mid 60s or, or no, I'm sorry, not in the mid 50s, right? So he's accessing care around 1969, very similar to the figure CK that I talked about today. Um, and so to know that someone endured a lifetime um, when, contemporarily we have, you know, some figures who are saying, you know, in the 1960s, you know, trans wasn't even an option for people like me or if I was racialized or whatever, the access wasn't there. But yet we have someone who was, you know, poor, brown and access care um, for themselves, but also um, was gay, right? And um, died of, of AIDS and so we, and had a child, right? So there's all these nuances to read within the obituary that 
I will write about it at some point, but um, uh, it's it's it, it was it was hard to to fit into the archive that I had for the book. Yeah. All right. This next question comes from Salvador Vidal Ortiz. Can you speak about a relational sense of discrimination for other non Chicano Latinx communities? I remember in the 60s that sexologists and psychiatrists did not allow Puerto Rican trans women because they didn't quote look like women. Were there connections in the archives you sought out that either connected other non Chicanx or trans women to trans men? And if there aren't connections, how do you account for that? Um, or how do you accept that? Um, so one, so in that in that same volume where I got that essay by Ira Pauli, he has another companion essay, which is about, um, you know, trans women, right? And so he also has, um, and interestingly, the story. So let me back up. So in the footnotes about CK, um, Ira Pauli has this footnote where he debated introducing CK to this other racialized trans Hispanic person. I don't know the person's ethnicity for sure. They might be Latinx or uh, Chicanx, Mexican American, another trans woman basically. He thought of introducing the two of them that they might find companionship among themselves, right? That was kind of his, his that was his kind of suggestion or solution to CK not being able to access or further care and his kind of alienation that he's sensing from like interviewing him. And so his what seemed like a solution to him was to introduce these two brown trans folks of trans woman and a trans man. Um, I, he isn't outwardly suggesting romance, but I think he's suggesting some kind of companionship or some kind of intimacy that they can be able to um, speak with each other. And the, the trans woman that he wants to refer him to, if I'm remembering correctly, it's been a while since I've looked at that, uh, the other essay, I don't think they're featured prominently in his kind of overview of these kind of case studies. So I know even less about her than I know about CK. Um, and so this really kind of shows me that there is some kind of shared or, or relations among how people like Polly are understanding racialized subjects mm -hmm. and just how they don't, there's, there, there's a, the, the, they don't fit into, they will not become assimilable. So the solution is to orient them towards each other so that they can find a way to live their, live out their lives in this kind of liminal status where they are undeserving of, you know, the resources to be the persons that they intend or imagine themselves to be. But then this also brings the question for CK, we don't, we don't know if CK ever imagined getting an operation because that's not in his narrative either, right? Mm -hmm. So this is all already imposed upon CK, um, and so um, that's that that's that that to me in itself is interesting, right? Like that the solution is to, and that's relational and and the related kind of discrimination between trans women and this trans man in the sense that you know Polly doesn't really know what to do, and his solution is to orient them towards each other, which I think is very very queer for sure yeah this question is from noah loney garcia how have other latinx academics taken your work i know it's one of the only ones of its kind and i know organizations like ajaas center these conversations and i would love to know how other uh latinx academics at your university take this research um I mean, at my university, I, I found everybody to be quite supportive. But I mean, I will say, I will say that if I had the, I've tried very unsuccessfully to get a job in a, a Chiganek studies department. Um, like I've gotten as far as being a final candidate, but the questions that are always asked to me by my non-queer and trans kind of colleagues or folks who don't do this work will say to me very, uh, I've had it happen in an interview, a person, he said, you know, I see what your work does for transgender studies because it's it's very, you know, it's that's I don't know what it is. I see what you do for it because you're talking about race, but I don't understand what your work does for Chicano and Chicana studies. Explain that to me. Um, and so, I mean, there's very clear. I, I don't think for in Chicana Chicano studies, there's the reception there. I think in what we could imagine as Latina Latino Latinx the Latinx studies. There's more room to engage in trans studies and queer studies by extension. I mean, Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx studies is where I 
cut my teeth in, in Chicano feminism informs a lot of my writing and what I do. Um, but I still don't think the field of Chicano studies, and I say Chicano is very purposefully, um, doesn't want to move because I think the type of Chicano, Chicanx masculinities I'm proposing as relational and really kind of disrupting biology from it, it's that's really inconceivable at this point. It's not, it's a hard discussion to have and it's, and, and that's what I, I want the work to do is to open up that discussion, not to have the solution, but to bring in that conversation of what that might look like. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. All right. Um, so this question is from Stephanie Clare. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm interested in the Por, Por Vida mural. I'd like to hear uh, Professor Galarte talk a little bit about the relation between the brown transmasculine figure and those portrayed on the side. I'm specifically interested in what I perceive as a separation between racialized gender and racialized sexuality in the mural. What is being made possible and or covered over in this separation? And how do you understand this separation? Or am I wrong to read it as separation? It's also the last sentence. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for their questions so far. I'm sorry I haven't thanked everyone I meaning to. Uh, but thank you, Claire, for the observation. I think that you're spot on. I think that there's a clear, um, uh, I mean, if we look at the mural pedagogically, I think that's what it's trying to teach us, right? That, you know, these two figures are the two man, the two cholos and the two cholas, right? We are encouraged to imagine and to be drawn into the fantasy of the romance. Um, and then, you know, trans is just about gender, right? So we don't, we aren't imagining any kind of affective love, any kind of desire, mm -hmm. right? We're imagining a patriarch, right? Because if he's supposed to be passing as a man, right, um, then he's kind of solitary in the middle, flanked by, and that, and that's what's clear about the mural itself, right? Also, it said this, we have like, what would be a patriarch kind of look, with this forward looking gaze who is flanked by these two very clear scenes of desire, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a separation, but we have to do a little more work as readers to really kind of see that what trans does to the, these two scenes of queer desire, right? Like we can choose to read them separately. And I think pedagogically it does, it teaches us that, but then if we think a little bit more about what those two scenes might represent when we understand this as a trans, you know, I, I don't want to call him patriarchal. Um, I want to imagine for myself that he might not be patriarchal, but kind of, you know, if the trans person is, has a future oriented gaze, then what does that mean for these two um, queer couples on the side as well? What would the trans future oriented gaze mean for um, these two queer couples on the side? All right, well, Chingy, have you, do you have any more questions in the queue? Okay. Um, we'll give like, oh, Chingy has a question. Do you want to just ask it? Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, we have a lot of young scholars in the audience today. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, you might talk a little bit about your your journey um, to become a scholar and also your journey in terms of um, writing and uh, publishing your first book. Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, uh, my journey to be a scholar, I mean, I didn't imagine myself becoming a professor when I went to graduate school. Like, I think many folks after, I knew that when I graduated from undergrad, I didn't really want to work a nine to five job. Um, and I was like organizing around, like, you know, around various things in Southern California at this time, it was like the early 2000s, you know, and I was really interested in Paulo Freire and his pedagogy. And so I decided I wanted to get a master's in education to maybe someday open up my own kind of Chicano, Chicanx kind of school, like, you know, alternative high school, something like that in that, in that range, or being some kind of educational administrator to make changes and make access more equitable for um, racialized folks. Uh, but then I taught, I was a TA in a, in a Latino studies class and it just felt really easy um, to be a teacher with undergraduates and to be in that position and to teach Latino studies. And I had been a Chicano studies, Chicano Chicano studies major as an undergrad. And so I was like, oh, okay, there's something that 
you know, I enjoy and I feel like I'm pretty good at. I was my I had really great rapport with my students. And so then I decided and changed like, okay, maybe being an academic is what I need to do. And so that's where I took that turn. And then I discovered queer studies and then later trans studies. And it was like, oh, how can I make all of these mesh together, right? Chicano, Chicano studies, Latino studies, queer studies, trans studies. How can I bring all of those in conversation? And I saw that there wasn't, there was bits and pieces of conversation, but they weren't all kind of coming together. And so that's really what I, I wanted to do. And writing the book was really hard because I felt really early on, I needed to have a sense of mastery of every single one of these fields and like history and like how they emerge and their origins and genealogies. And so after finally kind of getting over, like, I know enough, I don't, I don't think can't say, and two, it's mastery is something that's really kind of impossible to achieve, right? Undisciplining yourself for desire for mastery. And so then I became more free to write the book and, uh, and continue to collect various narratives. And then really kind of think clearly around who are the theorists that I really, really love. And, and one is Jose Esteban Munoz, his work is really important to my work. And then it was working with Susan Stryker and my colleagues at the University of Arizona who were doing this amazing trans studies work and really learning from them and their approaches to their, their contributions to trans studies to, that brought everything together for me. And so publishing the first book was really, it was, it was it was learning at every step um, for me, I would say, because it was learning, you know, trans studies, learning queer studies, and then in different in different moments of my trajectory, right? Like as a graduate student, and then as an assistant professor, and then, you know, like, and so uh, I think that's that that was my experience, and I think is what I like to teach my own students who are graduate students, right? Like mastery is not a thing we we. I like to have my, I compel my, I ask my students to be compelled by the text or the objects that bring them in and kind of move from there. What is drawing you in and what is compelling to you and kind of move outwards from there and, and figuring out what you need to read, what text you need, what text might go together and what might not go together. Thank you. All right, well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Galarte. This was such a pleasure to uh, learn from you and talk with you today. Um, and thanks to everyone who attended. It's it's so great to see everyone here, especially all my students from <laughs> 301. Um, and I hope that you all have a great afternoon and uh, see you later. Keep uh, keep your eyes peeled for our Chingy. Do you want to share the details for our next event that's coming up in the Imagining Trans Future series? Sorry to push you on the spot. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming. Um, our last speaker for this academic year is going to be Dr. Cameron Auckland Rich. Um, and we'll be talking Thursday, March 4th, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and I believe if you signed up uh, to register for this event, there was an option that you could check uh, to find out more information um, about that event. So we hope that you will join us for that event as well. All right, well, thank everyone so much and I hope you all have a great afternoon. <laughs>